Hello and welcome to uh, Allegedly Speaking. This is Allegedly Dave. Tonight I want to be talking about courage. In these shows of Allegedly Speaking I, I kind of choose a topic and reveal its hidden side and I want to talk about uh, uh, courage tonight and, and discuss what's going on around the world. So here in Turkey which is where I am at the moment. And if you can hear um, noise and uh, a bit of a, a wind noise from behind me, <laughs> it's because uh, the air conditioning's on because uh, it's bloody hot here. <laughs> so, um, so apologies for that. Uh, here in Turkey, um, we're, we're seeing the protests because, well, essentially we're seeing a, a, a people push too far. Uh, and the same is occurring in many places around the world. The the protests in Turkey basically started off over plans to redevelop a a, a very popular park but then it soon got out of hand. In Brazil the protests there started because the government decided to uh, hike up bus fares and you know uh, public transport fares. So um, I I picked out a story uh, about Brazil. This is from Sao Paulo. Leaders in Brazil's two largest cities said yesterday that they reversed uh, an increase in bus and subway fares that ignited the anti-government protests that have spread across the nation in the past week. Many people doubted the move would quiet the demonstrations, which have moved well beyond the outrage over fare hikes into communal cries against poor public services in Latin America's biggest nation. It's not really about the price anymore, said um, Camelia Senna, an 18-year-old university student uh, at a protest in Rio de Janeiro's sister city of uh, Niteroi. People are so disgusted with the system, so fed up now, we're demanding change. Senna added that uh, seeing money poured into uh, soccer stadiums for the current Confederations Cup and next year's World Cup only added fuel to to people's anger. It's not that we're against the World Cup, not at all. It will bring good things for Brazil. It's just that we're against the corruption that the World Cup has become an excuse for, she said. At a press conference in Sao Paulo uh, to announce the reversal of the public transport fare hike, Sao Paulo's mayor, Fernando Haddad, said it will represent a big sacrifice and we will have to reduce investments in other areas. He didn't give details on what other cuts would occur. Rio de Janeiro's mayor, mayor, Eduardo Perez, also confirmed the fare increase would be rescinded in that city. Scattered street demonstrations continued in some parts of Brazil, including Niteroi, as protesters demand improvements in public services they receive in exchange for high taxes and rising prices. So, what we're seeing here, um, just like in Turkey, where uh, the government basically said, "Oh no, we're we're going to we're going to um, put the redevelopment plans on hold until the courts will, uh, you know, rule on it," which uh, we all know is uh, is a, a bit of a joke, really. The uh, Brazilian government basically said, "Oh no, we're going to reverse the transport fare hikes." So the point is, it's too late. Um, the genie is out of the bottle. You know, it's not about fair hikes or park redevelopment plans. These are the last straw. It's a it's a culmination of of hundreds of abuses and injustices and government criminality. The same thing is happening in England, but we don't seem to be able to see it. <laughs> you know, collectively, we don't seem to be able to see that there's anything worth taking action over. Um, but let's let's maybe just have a look uh, at what's occurring in our own country. We are the most surveilled people in the entire world. There's there's a camera, and I think it's, there's more now, but I think there's a camera for every, uh, every 15 of us, there's a camera. <laughs> That's staggering, and I think you know. Really, I mean, that's that, that's the figures we're allowed to have. I'm sure there's a lot more out there. It's uh, it's it's coming up to there's a camera for every man, woman, and child on you know in this country. Since 1990, 1,500 people have have died, uh, read murdered, in police custody. 
you know, so some of them have been execution style, and there have been no repercussions whatsoever from from the police. And I mentioned this before when I spoke about um, about uh, and I've forgotten the name now, Ian Tomlinson. Um, being killed in broad daylight um, in front of uh, hundreds of witnesses with with video of the event and and yet um, the, the the police officer involved just walked away with no no repercussions whatsoever um, even though he was I, I believe it was uh, he was um, convicted of uh, unlawful killing or something like that but yet no repercussions whatsoever the, the, in this country now, there is detention without charge. There are secret courts going on. The The right to protest has been removed from us. And you can look this up. It's in the Serious and Organised Crime and Police Act 2005. You know, we've lost the right to, to, to say anything about um, you know, what, what's happening to us and, and, and to, to protest against it. We've seen agent provocateurs um, uh, coming out in every every protest that uh, that um, has occurred over over recent years we've seen these these agent provocateurs you know, police um, undercover police pretending to be uh, protesters um, they're solely to to whip up violence to start destroying property um, and uh, you know the, it's, it's very badly done, you know. The, the the cops are there, dressed up in uh, in identical clothes, uh, you know, all with masks across their face, um, uh, and uh, they're always there trying, you know, trying to uh, trying to smash windows, uh, and uh, you know, burn car police cars up and whatever. But we 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 spotted them. We can see them, um, and and that that sort of leads very nicely into the uh, the. The current scandal, the undercover police infiltration of uh, of uh, you know of any group that that might want to stand up and say, "Hang on a second, there's something wrong here." Um, whenever there's a, a group of, of people, it seems the police must get their nose in there and uh, and try and subvert it and um, and and you know in 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 a lot of cases lead these groups into into um, actions that will get them get them uh, nicked basically so so it's it, it's it, it's kind of endemic this is this is a um, a place that uh, you know we we never thought we'd ever get to um, I'm missing out this this thing here that uh, um, there is a massive institutionalized paedophile class now, or well, I say now, I think they've uh, pretty much always existed. You know, it includes top people in media, judges, high-ranking police, uh, politicians, and they're preying on hundreds of thousands of our children who disappear without a trace every year. I think it's something like uh, somewhere close to 400,000. Um, perhaps that's, um, I think I'm, I'm quoting the American figures, but between America Canada and this country it's a million children disappear without a trace every year without a trace you know that if you sit down and think about it that is impossible how can that be how can a million people disappear you know this this isn't by accident this isn't kids running away this is this is some institutionalized um, well-organized uh, um, machine that uh, that preys on children, and um, now that uh, it's, you know a small fraction of this is coming out, um, we, we're seeing uh, that the, the machinery of, of government and uh, law and um, just stepping in and covering it up, and uh, you know. Um, becoming a barrier to to uh, to uncovering this um, yes of course one or two sacrificial lambs are, are, are going to be uh, uh, are going to be held up and uh, and and punished but you know I doubt that um, and I say I doubt where they're not actually punished very much you know the we're, we're looking at uh, Stuart Hall here where 
he he gets basically a slap on the wrist. He's I think he's in his eighties now. He's going to get a slap on the wrist. Um, a few uh, maybe uh, I can't remember what it was. It was a, a, a few months in uh, in prison, which I can tell you is, is not going to be uh, your run of the mill prison. Um, and uh, he'll be out in, a, in, in probably in a month with uh, so-called good behaviour. Um, and I think I posted this on, on Facebook that uh, the judge that gave such a lenient uh, sentence um, was, uh, was basically convicted of uh, sexual crimes himself. So um, this, is, this is one hand covering the other. So, I mean, why, can't we see this? Can't we, can't we as a nation step back and and see the big picture at this point. I, I picked up this this other um, statistic. Well, it's more than statistics actually. It's uh, um, uh, a whole a whole article um, based on research over the last five years, where it's, it's come out that more than four thousand police officers were disciplined for criminal behaviour in the last five years. This includes like an inspector who was uh, sacked after being arrested for shoplifting and a PC who resigned after uh, installing a camera in a lady's toilet. You know, there was a, a sergeant who in, in Lancashire who was sacked after um, he was discovered with three submachine guns and, uh, and ammunition. And uh, there was a, a colleague of his from uh, the same force who resigned after being caught drug trafficking. Um, the, the, the numbers of, of police officers who were found guilty of misconduct has basically shot up by 56% uh, from, from 559 in 2008 to 873 in 2012. You know, uh, in total, 4,115 um, one, officers were disciplined over criminal behaviour, uh, of which... 643 were dismissed or forced to resign. <laughs> this is the thing, you know, these, these uh, bureaucrats, these, these um, house slaves, and I've mentioned this before, how, how we, we have, uh, uh, because we're all slaves in this system, we have uh, some slaves who are more equal than others. Um, those are the house slaves. They're the ones who get, uh, you know, preferential treatment. They're the ones who, who, who get better food, you know, and uh, that sort of thing. Um, but their job is to keep the rest of the slaves down. And these are the house slaves. And and this, um, what we're seeing is, uh, is, is them exercising their perks for for being for being house slaves for keeping the rest of us down. So these are the only people who, when faced with criminal charges, um, are allowed to just simply resign. And all of a sudden, the charges go away. <laughs> um, how does that work for the rest of us? I don't think that works the same way for the rest of us. You know? We can't just simply say, OK, no, I won't, go, I won't be in that job anymore if, uh, now that I've been caught, to, <laughs> caught um, committing a crime. No, it doesn't work for us. But it works for uh, for um, for politicians and and uh, police officers. Uh, doesn't matter what they've done, pretty much. Um, I, I believe um, I think it's Harwood, the the the, uh, the police officers in uh, police officer in the um, Ian Tomlinson case. Uh, it, it was revealed that he, in fact, was. Uh, uh, I think he did something else criminal um, in the past. He resigned and then got um, got another job in another another police force. <laughs> so you you can you can commit a crime, resign to get away from it, and then resume your job somewhere else, and that's and that's fine. Um, more than a hundred of these people who were dismissed and forced to resign. Uh, over criminal behaviour were at the rank of inspector or higher. And, and, and some of these, these offences are extremely serious. Um, the, the, uh, uh, there was a PC in South Yorkshire who was, um, was sacked for um, assaulting a partner and two others who um, resigned after being arrested for perverting the court, course of justice. 
you know, this is their job, by the way. And <clears throat> we know that the, uh, as I just said, the, the punishment handed out to these officers um, are, are, <laughs> are, are laughable. Um, l most of them are let off with written warnings, um, you know, for, for offences that the public would deem totally unacceptable. We watched the film 1984. Most of us watched that and, and, and thought, in the back of our minds, we thought, wow, lucky we, we don't live in that sort of world. <laughs> I'm sorry, but we do. We've actually surpassed 1984. You know, this world is, is, is now beyond that point. When, it, when are we going to realise that? When you factor in the the seriously poor crime detection rate of the police and the incidence of these police officers covering each other's asses, and the number of cases of wrongdoing that have been just basically ignored uh, or covered up or a pretend investigation is performed um, and and you know receiving the standard uh, finding that the uh, officer did his job uh, correct correctly then I, I would say that um, the decent, honest behaviour that we, we kind of expect of uh, the police force is not representative of today's police. <laughs> we are beyond 1984. In, in other countries, this behaviour is, uh, is, has been spotted and, uh, and people are, uh, are taking action. The thing is, here in the UK, or in the UK, the agenda is, is much slower than anywhere else. It's, it's the boiling frog uh, syndrome, you know. You, you, you can't uh, just throw a, a live frog into boiling water. You have to put the frog in nice warm water and very slowly um, and turn up the heat. And before long, the frog is boiled to death without noticing. Um, and and that's that's... The situation we're in in the UK, we the the agenda is moving very slowly um, here, but uh, moving a lot faster everywhere else, and uh, perhaps that's why we're not noticing it. Um, it's nonetheless, it's it's been steady and relentless. It is slow, but it has been uh, it has been relentless. They've spent many decades getting us addicted to, to benefits and health care and obviously their money. And now that the, the majority of us are, are dependent on these things, they're very, very deliberately withdrawing the, it from, from us. And more than that, they're jeering at us and they're goading us. Uh, the, the system is, is, is like a bully that's knocked us down and uh, stolen our lunch money. It's now pissing on our heads and laughing saying what are you going to do about it <laughs> and and this is um this is what i've 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 seen in in turkey uh, as well the uh the president um Edouan, um basically jeering at the 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 people by um by attacking their their hero ataturk um and calling him a drunk now as i said this guy um, and we're not used to having heroes, but the, this guy Ataturk was was a national hero. The people loved him, um, and for for a politician um, to to just make fun of this guy is uh, is is one of the deepest insults, I think. So it seems like the governments uh, around the world are trying to uh, are trying to provoke provoke a reaction in the, in their people. Obviously, this is a, uh, a, a coordinated uh, agenda uh, around the world. Um, essentially, I think they want to get the whole world up in arms and, uh, and all rioting uh, at the same time um, so that they can justify bringing in their new world order and one world army so that, uh, you know, for the sake of security for the whole world, uh, we need to bring in this... Uh, um, this this one world army to quash this uh, you know this dissent and this um, this this danger to to the public. No, never mind that it's actually the public that uh, that that want want the change in the first place. The thing, the reason why I think um, the agenda is 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 happening much slower in the UK 
is because uh, I believe uh, the the UK is special, um, in as much as uh, it is the the seat and the heart of of this control mechanism. Yeah, it uh, it was propagated around the world by the uh, the British Empire, which never really left. It's still it's still um, alive and well today. Um, it's just that it's been cloaked in secrecy. Um, but uh, the uh, this this is the seat of all this. And if we get if we manage to get it right in the UK, I believe that that it will propagate across the world um, because of this of this network of this this being the the, the centre of the spider's web. You see, um, Iceland found their solution but Iceland is a very isolated island and um, you know it, it, it has been uh, uh, effectively um, been uh, ostracized you know, and, and isolated by the media who won't won't talk about it they won't uh, they won't mention what's happened in Iceland uh, because they don't want us to know that there is a solution available they don't want us to want us to know that uh, you know, we could, if we wanted, to um, just end the government. Say, nope, you're not in power anymore. The people are taking over, and uh, we're going to um, elect our own, our own government. We're going to change our own, uh, change our constitution, rewrite our constitution for um, to to make sure this this sort of thing doesn't happen again. Um, but I don't think, I don't think. Iceland solution um, will work for us. We have to find our own solution. Um, and when when we do find our Iceland solution, I believe it will change the world. So uh, a choice, a choice is being presented to us right now. We have to we have to actually step back and. <laughs> There's no point in uh, saying we have to step back and see this because um, this is this is so blatant now. This is so obvious um, that if you can't see it, it's because you're not you're not looking. You don't want to see it. You know, it's the the government. These people who call themselves our leaders. Well, hang on, they're not our leaders. They're our public servants. They're supposed to be looking out for us because they're supposed to understand what we're going through. But wait a second. Those, these people aren't the same as us. They're all multimillionaires. You know, they don't know what our life is like. So how, <laughs> how are they saying that they, they know what's best for us? Well... <laughs> Well, if you if you look at it objectively, you can see how um, where, where their uh, their justification of knowing what's best for us is is because they are the ruling class, or at least uh, in actual fact they're the lackeys of the ruling class. But uh, their their justification is is the same as um, the master um, uh, over the slaves. That's their justification. Well, you know, we're the masters. So we know what's best for you slaves. So this choice is presented to us. You know, we'll, we can go on letting these, uh, letting these people uh, decide how our lives should be. And, you know, <laughs> how is that working out for us at this point? <laughs> how is your life... Uh, um, uh, rolled out for over the last five years has it got better or has it got worse we we now know that uh, we now know <laughs> most of the people listening to me uh, have known for a long time that uh, this has been a slow controlled demolition of uh, the financial um, and uh, um, well the uh, slow demolition of of our society um we again were baited with this, uh, you know, this wonderful society where um, you know, the, uh, we've got a, 
uh, system in place that will uh, take care of us if we lose our jobs or uh, if we get sick. Um, uh, you know, um, it's a wonderful benevolent society. I think this is the big society that they're talking about. But um, this wonderful society that we were baited with, and, and maybe it looked like it worked. You know, when we we, we were first uh, offered it and we were first started using it, yeah, it seemed uh, it seemed very nice indeed. But very slowly, boiling frog style, it's been withdrawn from us. And when you when you've been used to, been conditioned into uh, expecting these things, and they're slowly being withdrawn from you, it seems human nature in this case is to hang on to what you've got, uh, keep your head down, um, and and hope that uh, you know it's not going to affect you, and you'll you'll be you'll be okay, but it's you're not going to be okay. It's They've started with the uh, fringes of society, you know, and um, um, by withdrawing the benefits from the these uh, the fringes of society, the majority of people don't think it's going to affect them. Now, obviously, it's not affecting them to start with. So, if you're not um, if you're not disabled, if you're not uh, an old age pensioner. Yeah, these things aren't affecting you. If you're not on benefits, oh no, it's all right. It's just, it's just those benefits people. But um, very slowly, very quietly, it's it is starting to affect everyone. So so we have we we do have a choice. We can ride this thing until uh, until it ends. Until you find you hear that knock on the door, uh, and they come for you. Or you can stand up and do something about it. The choice here is whether you are, you're going to um, exercise your courage or not. Collectively, as a society, we, we've got to learn, we've got to relearn courage. You know, the, the banks and the monetary system have been like training wheels for us, you know, stabilizers. You know, um, it's time that we. we we rode our bike without the training wheels. You know, if we had to do without the system, if uh, something, you know, happened, um, something serious happened and uh, the system just ended tomorrow, you know, we would have to find a way to, to live without the system. And we would find a way to live without the system. I'm not saying it will be easy to start with. There'll always be a, a very painful transition period. But we would find a way to 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 live without the system. That's what we do. We adapt. That's that's how we've we've be, uh, got to the position we are we're in at the moment. We we adapt to situations. So why don't we uh, pretend we have to? Why don't we just have to change the way we live? David Icke. Um, now I. I I think uh, my, I have my own ideas of uh, you know who and what David Icke is, but uh, he makes a, a very good point that um, as a as a herd, we can be controlled, moved around, and picked off, and, and that's how they've kept us as a herd, thinking as a, and and moving together as this as this big herd of uh, of dumb animals basically. Um, but if we decided to to be individuals. And follow our own path, then that control is impossible. And and he makes uh, he makes reference to uh, a story about how uh, two pigs escaped on the way to uh, the abattoir, and it it basically took an army of of animal handlers and RSPCA and abattoir staff and police with dogs uh, to, to to hunt them down. And uh, they got the uh, they got the nickname, nicknames Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Pig, and they were on the run for for eight days. And at the end, um, they actually ended up escaping, becoming pork chops because they'd become celebrities. And the film, I think, the film was called The Le Legend of the Tamworth Two, <laughs> and, and they um, they basically ended up living out their lives in a, a in an animal sanctuary. But this is the point. The rest of the herd, 
well they they became uh, pork sausages um but there were two that that took a chance and they they made a run for it um and they escaped their fate and that brings me to something that um that Terence McKenna once said and uh, I'll be playing um my my favorite Terence McKenna clip at the end of this but he said nature loves courage so if two pigs can decide to do their own thing and it took the establishment eight days to stop them and uh, and yet they still managed to escape their fate imagine 60 million people doing the same thing 60 million people um, doing their thing the establishment couldn't cope with that the, the establishment would end everyday courage has few witnesses but yours is no less noble because no drum beats for you and no crowd shout your name that was a quote from Robert Louis Stevenson everyday courage has few witnesses but yours is no less noble because no drum beats for you and no crowd shout your name everyday courage is being displayed in places like Taksim Square in in, in Turkey and uh, um, Rio de Janeiro in, in Brazil and countless other places in the world um, we've, we've got to the point in, in this life lifetime this, this life that we're living right now where life is very comfortable it's very convenient but it's not always been that, that way in previous ages we would have had to um we would have had to fight wars we um we would have had to you know um when i say fight wars i don't mean the uh the the wholesale slaughter that passes for war in uh, in this day and age but uh, we would have had to fight wars with swords and spears and and whatever we can pick up um uh, and in order to defend our uh, literally defend our families defend our our land to defend our way of life directly against somebody who was coming on our land to try and kill us yeah we would have had to we would have had to um risk our lives to defend what we had uh, th these days um, I, I'm seeing it all over, uh, all over YouTube, especially, where um, things happen in front of us that w we wouldn't stand for. We can't stand for. Somewhere inside us, we 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 don't want to stand for, for it. But yet, we stand by and video it <laughs> in in previous ages, and and don't think for one minute that you weren't around in those previous ages and it's uh, you know it's no longer you know hippie talk to say that well, you were there you you lived in those previous ages and you experienced these things but but now we've been we've been softened we've been <sighs> controlled and uh, and and brainwashed and manipulated into being these weak creatures who who don't live life anymore but we watch it and we think the the best thing we can do is record something so that others can watch it we don't take a part in life anymore everywhere around the world we're seeing extraordinary acts of courage people in Turkey and Brazil and other places around the world courageously standing up for their freedom where mostly people in their own country aren't seeing it in fact here in Turkey I think there's only one television station that's showing anything or they were showing anything of the of the uh, of the protests all the others were were you know not showing anything of it they were showing uh, football or uh, the Turkish equivalent of uh, X Factor or whatever but uh, most people in the country weren't seeing this and yet and yet you you have thousands upon thousands 
um, of grandparents, students, housewives, you know, taking to the streets, risking injury, tear gas, water cannons, and not just water cannons. It's you know, it's revealed that the water cannons were being um, dosed with uh, with corrosive chemicals. So I mean, <laughs> the water cannons are. are, are devastating enough if you get hit with a water cannon you're not standing you're not standing up you're being pushed over and uh, and bashed against the uh, walls and pavements and stuff but uh, to add insult to injury they put corrosive chemicals in there to 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 burn your skin so the people are risking that and tear gas and rubber bullets and steel batons they're risking their lives because they realize that their lives mean something you know, they, they, they can't be content with being watchers of life. You know, and that realisation comes with risks. We've been raised in a culture of safety and fear. As children, we're shielded from any risks whatsoever. Health and safety. That's the purpose of health and safety. We've had this idea of health and safety drummed into our heads over the last 20 or 30 years. Oh, yeah, you, you must have a fence by that dangerous drop. Otherwise, somebody might fall over it. <laughs> well, only pretty stupid people will fall over it. And <laughs> if they survive it, then uh, they've learned a valuable lesson. That's the point. So being raised as, as people shielded from risks point is we never face fear we never push our limits and so we never find out that we have no limits you know and everything in in our culture is pumping fear into us I, I've mentioned this before when I talked about television television is designed not only to program us but it's there to to pump fear into us continuously even when you're looking at something that seems innocuous um, it's been shown now that even the most innocuous uh, images you see on TV have been uh, spiked with subliminal messages. Things like uh, hidden skulls, skull and crossbones and things, images of death that you don't see consciously, but your subconscious sees them. And your subconscious causes your body to, to react to this stimuli. So you're always, if you watch television all the time and you read the newspaper and uh, you listen to the radio uh, and things like that, um, you're always in a, in, a, in a state of fear, constant low-level fear and stress. So when you're, when you're raised to, to, to not face fear, then you become essentially a, a, a coward. Um, you, you become scared of taking risks, scared of, of pretty much anything, because you are at, um, as I say, at this low level of fear that's always there, and it's always being um, poked at and prodded with, uh, you know, um, while you're watching television. If you if you imagine, uh, especially if you watch a um, an action film, action adventure film. Um, now, most people have seen it, have, uh, have watched a, um, an action film and found that they're really getting, getting into the film and their pulse is racing. They might find their, their palms are, are clammy or whatever um, because the film is so exciting. Well, that's because your, your body is experiencing the, the fear and the, the stress that's, uh, that's going on on screen. Your subconscious doesn't know that you're not experiencing the, those things. So, so in, in actual fact, you are experiencing those things. So you, you are in fear, even though you don't think you are, even though your conscious mind says to you, well, no, you're just sitting in your chair. You're all right. Don't worry. It's only happening on the TV. Your subconscious conscious doesn't know that. And, and your body is reacting to your subconscious, not your conscious mind. So in that regard, we've been turned into, into cowards. So I, I have something that you need to know. I've got a message for you right now. Okay, you ready for it? You're going to die. You are going to die. At some point, 
at some point you are going to die it could be 50 years from now it could be in five minutes <laughs> you don't know but you are going to die <laughs> this is the, this is the the, se <laughs> the secret that they're, uh, they're they've been trying to not hide from you I guess hide in plain sight but uh, um, been trying to keep you away from this idea that you're going to die and they've made it frightening and uh, uh, and it's, it's a terrible thing you are going to die but you are everybody is and nobody knows when it's going to be so <laughs> when you're when you're pumped up with fear and you know you don't want to die you're not going to do anything the 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 point is here is that you know you're born into this life with nothing you come in with nothing nothing you do here means anything nothing is permanent you could uh, in your lifetime build a build a, a, a massive castle but you know in in a thousand years in ten thousand years that castle won't be there anymore um, I'm not sure if I've uh, I've said this before on a previous uh, um, <clears throat> a previous broadcast. Uh, I, I read a story about a guy who was driving past his old neighbourhood and decided to, uh, to to stop by and see uh, you know see see where he grew up. He thought of himself as a bit of a tearaway, and he he felt sure that he'd he'd left a mark on his uh, on on his old community. And he, he, he went back to his old street uh, and to his old house and found that his, his neighbours were, were still there. Um, and one or two of the neighbours remembered him, just, uh, you know, had to be prompted, but they remembered him. And it dawned on him that uh, whereas his, his neighbourhood had made a, a strong impression on him, he hadn't made an impression on his neighbourhood. Eventually... Um, his neighbours will would uh, move away or 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 die or whatever, um, and all memory of him would have gone from that place. So this this is it. Nothing you do here, um, you know, um, will be permanent. Nothing lasts. The only thing that's uh, um, that makes any difference here. The only thing that's important is what you do what you do with your life how you react to the circumstances that are presented to you how are you going to act when um, as this this control grid is tightened around us yeah this is this is the thing this is the thing that's that's being um, being kept away from us right now with uh, with all this fear with uh, with all this health and safety, you know, we um, when we're not allowing ourselves to to be ourselves, we're we're just uh, allowing ourselves to be watchers, watchers of society, watchers of of life, letting life pass us by. We we watch television. It's it's kind of crazy, you know. We we use up our our real lives watching pretend people uh, uh, living pretend lives, uh, and and in so doing, we let our our real lives just slip away. Um, society is is trying to its hardest to 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 make our lives end sooner rather than later you know the uh, even the people who don't believe in any of the conspiracy theories or whatever um, they must be able to see now that um, there are poisons in our food there are poisons in the water you know the the medicines aren't doing anything for us vaccines don't work you know doctors aren't helping us you know if you go into a hospital you know, you risk cut and, um, coming out with uh, with more wrong with you than when you went in, or you risk even not coming out of them. You know, this civilization that we've found ourselves in 
is killing us softly while pretending to help us. When I was, uh, when I was in college, sometimes I used to bunk off and go to uh, the arcade. I was uh, in college in South End near the seafront. So I used to bunk off and go to the arcade occasionally and play my favourite video game. It was called Defender. If anyone's ever played, it's a little spaceship and you go around and you pick up people. And, uh, and one of the things you have is this idea of uh, smart bombs, which if you've got lots of en- enemies on screen, you could hit this smart bomb and all of them get destroyed. And you can fight on, you can live to fight on. Um, now, the, the thing that I used to hate happen is to uh, is to lose all my lives playing defender um, uh, and not use up all my smart bombs. It means that I've wasted my my game because I could have used those smart bombs and uh, and and carried on. <laughs> Do you really want to exist in this uh, in this life in fear and utter safety? so that you can die safely on your bed? Or do you want to live your life boldly and die having used all your smart bombs? <laughs> that's, uh, you know, that's the way I see it. There's, there's a war going on outside your door, and it's against you. It's against you, your family, your friends, your neighbours. And, and we all know it at some level or other. It's, it's too, too in our faces not to see it anymore. And uh, we, we all do have a choice. You can ignore it and do the uh, emotional equivalent of hiding under your bed um, while you anaesthetize yourself in you know, working 70 hours a week, doing something that's utterly meaningless or, and, and shopping to buy stuff that makes you, yourself feel worthwhile or important or fulfilled, uh, which it doesn't really, never does. Um, and use up the rest of your time, you know, in a in in a synthetic video game reality, or watching people um, pretend people pretend to live pretend lives on a glowing screen, you know. You know, uh, is this what you want to do? Hide under your bed until that day when your your door is kicked in and they come for you. Well, there is another choice. Well, there are several choices, actually. And another choice that uh, most, people, uh, most people seem to have is this, uh, well, it's the, it's the exercising this belief that uh, there is nothing that you can do about it. Well, I'm not somebody who advocates violence. I don't believe that's the way. Um, besides, they're ready for that. This is this is why they are jeering at us. This is why they're pushing us with uh, with all these things: bedroom tax and council tax, and they're <clears throat> withdrawing the safety net from under us, and then withdrawing the jobs that are keeping us out of that, um, uh, you know, out of the fire, um, and uh, and and laughing at us while they're doing it. Violence isn't the way because, uh, uh, and it is because it is the, uh, the the reason why they're jeering at us. They're, they're they're provoking us to make us angry, make us violent. They've shown us lots of images of people reacting to what we're feeling in a violent way, with protests, with uh, with um, with destruction of property. That isn't the way. They want us to do that so they can crack down on us. That isn't the way. The way to stand up to this is to change yourself. I think it's Alan Watts who said that you cannot fix your hair by combing the mirror. You can't change things out there. Essentially, going into the holographic universe type view of it, there is no out there. There is only inside you. Yeah? And you have to you have to change yourself. You know you can't change anything out there. You can't change the, ref- the reflection. And everything out there is a reflection of yourself. And we have to start taking responsibility for that. 
Everything out there, everything we're seeing out, out, outside of ourselves is a reflection of, of who we are. And we have to change who we are. And said, what matters in this world, the only thing that matters is what we do. How we react to situations as they're presented to us. And uh, how we will decide to experience it. You know, um, there is no need for fear. Fear is only there to impose those limits on us. There is no such thing as, as good or bad. You know, they're just human labels on varying degrees of experience. Uh, I'm, d I'm doing a lot of quoting actually <laughs> today. I don't know. I keep finding things to quote about. But um, <clears throat> there's a, a, an old Taoist story of uh, an old farmer who uh, had worked his crops for many years and one day his, uh, his horse ran away and, and on, upon hearing the news his neighbours came over to visit and said oh that's, that's really really bad luck they said and the farmer said we'll see and the next morning the horse returned bringing with it three other wild horses how wonderful the neighbours neighbors cried we'll see said the old man following day the, uh, the, the man's son tried to ride one of the untamed horses, was thrown and uh, broke his leg. The, uh, the neighbours came round to offer their sympathy and uh, the farmer said, we'll see. The day after that, the military officials came to the village to draft the young men into the army. Seeing that the, uh, the son's leg was broken, they passed him by and the neighbours came out and congratulated, on, congratulated the farmers on how well things had turned out. We'll see, said the farmer. So, <laughs> life flows. Life flows. And, and w whatever you think will be a, a, a bad thing, you never know how, how, how it's going to turn out, how it's going to play out in this game that we're playing, this flow that we're in. You know, we're, we're not this, this static thing. You know, we're not in this static life. We can change this life at any moment we, we want. But we need, we need the courage to do that. You know, a, a, a game isn't uh, um, uh, worthwhile or isn't fun if, if it's all ladders and no snakes. You know, there has to be bad, there has to be good. You know, there has to be things to fear. But we're here to uh, overcome that fear. A, a change is coming a change is definitely coming you, we all can see it as I say even the, the, the most um, asleep person can, can see that this change is coming civilization I think will, will disappear but I don't think that's a bad thing I think we've been brainwashed into believing that civilization is a good thing Civilization essentially is the, the Catholic Church forcing itself on to lifestyles that have thrived for millions of years. I say millions of years, I don't say that by accident. Uh, communities and peoples that have lived well for, for millions of years uh, were, uh, were set upon by missionaries bringing civilization to them. And, uh, and the only thing that's really been brought to them is poverty, strife, uh, um, fear, pain, um, and you name it, the, the, the worst of the worst. Um, and just because our short, brutal lives, and that's what they are, they're short and brutal, despite what, uh, what the, you know, the, the uh, civilizers have to told us, our lives aren't uh, the longest they've ever been. Um, it's quite funny when you think about it. Um, they don't say that our lifespans have in, in, improved. They say our life expectancy has improved. Think about that for a second. Our lifespans haven't improved. At the end of the uh, 19th century, um, in America, there were... Uh, there was a study done and they found that there were something like 4,000 uh, centenarians, people who lived to uh, uh, over 100. And then 50 years later, when the population had doubled, the uh, number of centenarians 
had halved. So that's that's one of the things that's showing us that uh, our lifespans are being shortened. And I could talk a, a hell of a lot more about that um, uh, that topic because, uh, as I've said uh, <laughs> to many people, that uh, I'm reading I'm reading some very old books at the moment, and they are <laughs> they're opening opening my eyes to some some amazing truths that that we're not being we're not privy to that we've been uh, we've been lied to about. And the the point is that uh, uh, civilization is is bad for us, you know. This um, herding together in 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 these uh, these massive cities, and they are massive. I mean, I, I don't know I even know how many people are in um, uh, uh, living together in London now. It's got to be sort of something like eight million or something. Um, but having eight million people crowded together in in these uh, these dirty, smelly um, these cities uh, is not good for us. One of the things that uh, we we overlook in our health is the effect that air, bad air, has on us. Now, the air that we breathe, the active part of it is is oxygen, obviously, and. Uh, apart from the fact that uh, our oxygen levels have declined um, over the last uh, few hundred years, um, mainly due to uh, our, our good friends, the uh, elite class and their, their corporations, um, deforesting the planet for us. Apart from that, the, the quality of our air determines the quality of our health. Um, and um, it's kind of explained um, in a number of uh, experiments that were done. And uh, I'm trying to explain this experiment um, they did with uh, a bird that they put in a bell jar. Now, this bell jar was able to uh, um, sustain this bird for three hours. So it had three hours worth of air in this, in this bell jar. Now, after two hours, they took this bird out. Now, obviously, the bird could live in that in that air for another for another hour. The interesting thing was that if you put a a, a healthy bird, a normal bird, into that um, two-hour-old air, that bird would die immediately. In an environment that a bird that was uh, become accustomed to it uh, would would be able to live in for another hour. So. Uh, another thing, if you were able to keep that uh, um, that air at the two-hour level of toxicity, that original bird will be able to live on for, say, you know, another five years, perhaps. If if that bird's lifespan, natural lifespan, was ten years, it might be able to live in that uh, that hostile environment for another mm, another five years, perhaps. So what that's telling us is that the quality of our air. And in this case, it was the fact that we're breathing out, you know, our, our lungs are a, a way of um, excreting toxins from our body. So it's not just carbon dioxide we're breathing out, we're breathing out toxins that our body's trying to get rid of. So our bodies can get used to uh, increasing levels of toxicity at the expense of our lifespan. And that's what we're living in. When we're crowded together and herded together in these cities, we're being in increasingly um, toxified, um, and and our lifespans are, are, are shrinking, um, you know, as a result of this. One of the stories I found uh, um, this week was uh, one of um, how in America, well, it's Agenda Twenty One is 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 coming out, um, is 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 almost out in the open now. They're uh, I'm trying to find it. Oh, yeah, here it is. Um, the story was Obama, the Obama administration, plans to force Americans to move into the cities to redistribute the wealth. So this is it. This is, um, this is Agenda 21 now, out in the open. And they're using uh, this idea that, uh, oh, for economic reasons, which is the then excuse now for everything, for economic reasons, 
uh, it's best to uh, move everybody into the cities because, well, you know, we can't maintain the infrastructure for for these outlying suburbs and uh, and uh, rural areas. So, you know, best thing to do is everybody move into the cities. Ignoring the fact that the plans, the agenda for this has been there for decades, for actual decades. But then, here again, I'm, I'm preaching to the converted here. Um, I think most of us know that this is the agenda to, to rewild the planet and keep us in these mega cities huddled together and having these short, brutal lives. But the other option we have, the other option we have to this, uh, to this control grid that's around us, is to have the courage to do, to do what we're here to do, to do what those pigs did, and go our own way. <laughs> as uh, as as Paula just said um, in in a chat box, all these bad things. Um, well, we consider bad all these these terrible things are going to occur if we don't do something about it and it's not as I said it's not going taking to the streets um, that in my opinion is is good to highlight what the issues are to to show people that um, that it's not just them that uh, that's, doesn't like this it's not just them who feels this way that's the only the only good thing about uh, these protests. What needs to happen is that we change ourselves. And uh, again, <laughs> I'm going to go back onto uh, uh, the thing that I always say: is us taking responsibility for our lives and deciding to do what it is we're here to do. We're we're not here to work nine to five jobs making widgets or or filing paperwork or doing any number of meaningless things and and they are all meaningless you know even if you think your job has some merit some some higher purpose to it that purpose has been hijacked long ago it's been hijacked and redirected into hurting people into working for the agenda if you're a doctor, you're not a doctor anymore. You're a you're a drug pusher, pushing poisons to kill people slowly. If you're a police officer, or uh, supposedly a police constable, you know you're you're not there to uphold the law. You're not there to to help people. It's <laughs> it should be obvious even to the police now that they're not there to do that. They're there to, to enforce, enforce the rules, enforce the, uh, the rule set of this, uh, of this criminal elite to keep them safe, to, to protect their interests and their corporations. Even the police must be starting to see that even their livelihoods are under attack now. Now that it's out in the open that uh, they're there to protect the corporations, now the corporations are starting to take over that job too. G4S and Serco, they're positioned now and started taking over. Uh, I think it's Lincolnshire Police that are, uh, are owned by G4S. Well, it's, it's not long now before um, the corporations start well, very slowly taking over. Um, they, they'll come in with perhaps uh, they'll take over the uh, civilian staff and then um, well I, I say start taking over um, Lincolnshire has been taken over by G4S you know um, Devon and Cornwall has been taken by over by IBM you know this has happened it is happening now so instead of uh, this pretense of uh, police constables who have a duty of care and uh, job to serve and protect. We have corporations protecting corporations and, uh, and enforcing corporate rules. It's becoming obvious now. So we have to make the change in ourselves. We have to start turning away from this system, deciding that, uh, that none of the benefits of the system are benefits to us. 
they might seem like benefits and and be uh, very convenient and uh, you know some might make our lives seem easier and safer but that isn't helping us that isn't helping us you know our lives are too convenient our lives are too safe and I don't mean um, safe as in oh we you know we we should uh, we should be exposing ourselves to danger, but we shouldn't be afraid of it either. You know we shouldn't be we shouldn't be afraid. And and if 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 anything is is making you um, is making you frightened, we should be facing it. We should be looking at it and and examining it and, and approaching it and testing it. So we should be looking at um, looking at these fears and overcoming them, because that that is partially what we're here to do. We're given the situations. Well, I say we're given you know, from a from you know, my spiritual type point of view. It's you who's giving you these situations to deal with. Your universe, the 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 one that you inhabit, is your universe. It is all about you. You are the central player. You are the only uh, real player. You're the one that's important in this. It's like, it's like playing Call of Duty. The character on screen in Call of Duty or, or any of these first-person shoot 'em ups or whatever, um, that whole universe is being generated for that character, and and you are playing that character. Okay, everything that that character sees is for them. There is nothing there that can hurt you. There's nothing there that uh, that you can you should be afraid of, because you know it's it's your universe and you're presenting these things for you to overcome. And while you you waste your life, um, you know, living it vicariously through the television. Uh, and through uh, video games or any of the um, the limitless number of uh, distractions this world has presented you with to keep you from uh, you know keep from, keep you from living your life, you you will not live your life. So we've got to start making it that change in ourselves. We've got to um, start looking at um, what it is we're doing day to day. You know, is this what you're here to do? <laughs> Are you fulfilled by doing that nine to five job? If you're on the dole and not doing anything, is that what you're here to do uh, as well? I mean, the the only reason I think that people on the dole are are not doing things, you know, are feel paralysed, is because this whole system has told them that if they're not out there earning money, they're worthless. Money has become the only measure of, of value there is. Whereas everyone on this planet has unique skills, a unique perspective, something they can do that nobody else can do, something that they can see that nobody else can see. And it's about finding that. And, and, and as I said, we've been led away from that path of self-discovery because of, of all these things that we have to do. We supposedly have to do. The society has given us these things that we have to do. And one thing leads to another, leads to another, leads to another. Yeah, we have to put food on the on the table, so we have to have money, so we have to go to work, and uh, and oh, uh, we we have to have a car, so we have to pay uh, tax and insurance, and we have to have more money, so we may have to work more, so on and so on and so on, and you you get caught in this in this web of of things that you have to do, and you never get you never get anywhere. And if you live your entire life, if you live your entire life in this web, you'll look back on that life and, and realise that you actually haven't lived. And this is what this system is all about. It's about keeping you in this web. 
and it's time that we've, we, we, we see the web for what it is and break out of it. And how do you break out of it? Well, first of all, if you can do without, if you can look around your, your house, look around your house and see what it is that you can do without. What are the things that you don't need in your life? What are the things around you that are hurting you? I mean, y you have to start looking at every, every little thing. If you've got a microwave in your house, uh, find out about it. What is it? What is that microwave actually doing? If you do some research and look at, look at these things uh, critically, you'll find that the microwave, again, is a, a device that, yes, it, it, might, it might seem that it's nice and convenient, but it's actually another thing that's slowly killing you. Look at the food you're eating. Is it helping you? <laughs> look at look at your waistline. <laughs> you know, look at look at your health. You know, is this food helping you? Look at every aspect of your life. Tug at it, examine it. Don't be afraid of it. And make changes. If you really critically look at uh, uh, how your life is unfolding, you, you will see that the system is not allowing you to live. It's not allowing you to be you. It's time that you started being you. Or at least finding out who you are. And again, this society, this system, is about hiding who you are from you. At the end of the day, it, it is a game. It's a game that you've you've decided to play so so start playing it start playing it properly every time you you use the system to its fullest you'll find that you're hurting somebody and uh, and a lot of the time it's not only hurting you but it's hurting your, your family if you're trying to get um, more pay at work and you're working harder and harder and harder okay who's damaged there while you you think you're doing the best for your family who's actually being damaged well actually it's you and your family your family isn't isn't seeing very much of you while you're uh, you're working your ass off to to uh, to get more money and your family is being damaged everything you do in this system means sacrifice somewhere along the line Everything that you think you're doing that uh, is, is helping is hurting somewhere, someone, somewhere along the line. I can only talk about some of the changes that I've made in my life. And uh, there are some talks on YouTube about, about this as well. One, uh, one of them is called uh, My Spiritual Journey. And um, unfortunately, it's an hour and a half talk, but uh, <laughs> the last half hour was, was uh, um, well, the guy ran out of... Uh, uh, space on his camera and so he uh, he basically just uh, recorded the end bit and tacked it on uh, sort of an hour through the talk but anyway but um, I, I, so I can only talk about what I've found when I've actually stepped back and, and done this I started looking at my health and uh, started looking at what caused my bad health because I, I'd also fooled myself into believing that I was actually healthy and we do that we do that without thinking about it I'd uh, I'd ripped my Achilles tendon about four years ago playing football and uh, and after I had an operation um, I, I'd end up with uh, a massive scar down the, the back of my heel which um, which was was quite painful it was one of those uh, dull throbbing aches that were, was there all the time and I also had uh, nerve damage along the one side of my foot so that if I'd walked 100 yards maybe 10 times in 100 yards I'd get a, a, a stab of um, very painful pin, pins and needles so what had happened was I, I went on a, a fast and um, a few days into the fast I'd realised that uh, this pain and this nerve damage that had been with me for four years had disappeared. But the, the other realisation there was that 
I I had not even noticed that pain um, and and the the nerve damage. It had become part of me. And I'd fooled myself into believing that I was completely healthy because I discounted that pain that that, uh, had, had now become a part of me. And we do that all the time. There are things that are, um, are badly wrong with us, but we just accept them as part of us. And we've accepted that uh, ill health is, um, you know, uh, is, is actually um, a measure of health. <laughs> um, and it's not until those uh, problems, those uh, illnesses and whatever, uh, are taken away from you that you realize how sick you were in the first place. So I, I started looking at um, what I was eating. I started looking at um, what my response to any symptoms I was getting, which obviously, like uh, most people, would, was uh, let's go to the doctor, let's, let's start popping pills and, uh, and having injections and all sorts of things. I started to look at that and uh, realize that, well, you know what, no, they, these aren't the way I want to deal with these things. I realized that uh, the cause of most of the problems that I was, I was suffering with and facing were, was the, the food I was eating. So I changed my diet completely. I also realized that uh, the medical profession wasn't working for me. So I, I decided to take matters into my own hands and I researched how to make myself better. And, um, and I have. I'm not going to go into uh, <laughs> the therapies again because uh, I guess most people who are listening probably already know what uh, what therapies I've been using. But um, I started some therapies and um, I saw my health turn around completely. I looked at where I was living and how I was living and how the house that I was living in wasn't really a healthy place for me to be because I, I found myself more out of the house and uh, you know I, at the time I was going to a lot of festivals and uh, spending my time out of the house and, uh, and out in nature and I found that actually I feel better I feel better about, uh, uh, about where I was I felt better about myself I felt healthier I felt more alive out in nature than I did within four plasterboard walls and I, I, I decided that, well, I, I'm not going to live in four walls anymore. And I changed that. I also decided that um, I'm not going to be part of the system. I'm going to not use the system as much as possible. I'm, I, I, I don't use benefits. And uh, I decided I'm, I'm not going to work anymore. And once you decide things like that, you realize that a whole lot of things fall away fall away a lot of stresses and problems just fall away from you now one of the main stresses that people would uh, think they would have if they were to abandon their job and abandon their house and and things like that is money oh what am I going to do without money um, that sounds like it's going to be very stressful but the surprise is that the universe looks after you well, obviously it does, because the universe is about you. And since you're the main the, the player, the main event, the universe will look after you. We need the courage to make these changes. It is, it is very scary to leave your home uh, and change your way of life completely. But as, as Terence McKenna says... When you make the leap, because that's what the courage is there for, that's what the courage does, it allows you to make that leap into the unknown. When you make that leap, you'll find that there's a feather bed waiting for you. It isn't this scary, this scary thing full of stress, full of uh, problems waiting for you. It's, it's a feather bed. In my case... I was due to leave my house on the Monday morning. No, I think it was actually a Sunday night. That was my last day in my house. 
I had no idea on, and this was a Friday, I had no idea on the Friday where I was going to go after Sunday night. And uh, normally I'd be panicking. I'd be like, well, uh, you know, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? But I thought, uh, I don't have to leave until Sunday. Something will come up. I'll, I'll decide on Sunday where I go on the day. So I didn't worry about uh, I didn't worry about it. Later on that day, I got a phone call from a friend saying, "Oh, we're having a gathering um, uh, uh, over this weekend. Yeah, long weekend. So, do you want to come along?" I said, "Oh, okay." <laughs> and there it was. I knew I knew where I was going first, and that's what that's what how it's been working so far. It's like a scavenger hunt, or. It's like you go off uh, uh, on a direction and you'll, f- you'll get further instructions as you get there. And, uh, and so far, it's been, uh, I think it's been like four months now, and it's, it's been like that. The universe has been not only nudging me in, in certain directions, but it's been providing for me. And, and here I am. I'm, I'm living a, a, a very stress-free lifestyle now and yeah sometimes I do get uh, twinges of oh you know I wonder what what's going to happen what's going to happen I don't know but but they're only twinges and they're getting fewer and fewer and further and further apart and some might have seen the uh, the video I posted um, uh, a, a few weeks ago I literally set out with uh, a video camera. I didn't know what I was going to do. I just took the video camera. I brought a sketch pad with me, uh, and I just started walking across fields. And the the feeling that I got, just walking across these fields and stopping and listening to to nature and um, and just being there, was was just overwhelming. I felt I just had to make a video about it. I mean, this is this is you know Dave in the 21st century you know there's YouTube and all that oh I've got to make a video so um, to express myself there I I had to make a video and it it was I didn't know what I was making (laughs) Uh, I started off um, going off and retracing retracing my steps um, and filming myself walking through the countryside and and uh, I filmed myself meditating at one point and uh, and when I got to the to the end of my walk, which was a, a beautiful spot, the sheer beauty of it didn't translate over a video camera, but it was a breathtaking beauty. I just, I just felt I had to t- say something about it. So I, again, I don't know why I did the video, but um, it was because I, I felt so overwhelmed by being out there. Um, and it, this isn't a feeling that you can get within so-called civilization. And, and there's so much more out there than you can possibly imagine. But the system is making you afraid to find out, making you afraid to take that risk. That's why you, you weren't allowed to take risks at school. So you'd be too scared to take them when you became an adult. So, again, it's time, I think, for, for us all to take risks for us all to go our own way, become like the uh, the pigs who escaped the abattoir. It it is time that we took risks. Time we, that we we found that courage within us because it's still in there somewhere. Through all the conditioning that we've been given, uh, it's still in there. So, please try and find it, and you will be rewarded. You'll be rewarded beyond, uh, beyond your imagination. And you'll be able to find the real you. And you'll be, be able to find what you're here to do. So, to end this, I'm just going to play. It's only for a few minutes. It's, uh, it's um, a, a little uh, speech by Terence McKenna. There is a sort of fair play. You've been told from the cradle that the deck was stacked against you. Fall of man, original sin, so forth and so on. It's bullshit. It's absolute bullshit. There is a sort of fair play. And if you can get in touch with that in your life, you know, when Muhammad wouldn't come to the mountain 
the mountain came to Muhammad. That's fair play. And if you can have that perception, the world will begin to work for you. It will begin to move toward you as the mountain moved toward Muhammad. The mushroom said to me once, uh, nature loves courage. Nature loves courage. And I said, what's the payoff on that? And it said, it shows you that it loves courage because it will remove obstacles. You make the commitment and nature will respond to that commitment by removing impossible obstacles. Dream the impossible dream and the world will not grind you under. It will lift you up. This is the trick. This is what all these uh, uh, teachers and philosophers who really counted, who really touched the alchemical gold, this is what they understood. This is the shamanic dance in the waterfall. This is how magic is done. It's done by hurling yourself into the abyss and discovering that it's a feather bed. And there's no other way to do it. Uh, this is why I have always taken the position that as modern people, you know, we can't go out and uh, set armies marching or launch religions and who would want to anyhow. But to the people who say adventure has fled, it's all humdrum. I just know, you know, that they have forgotten the five grams of psilocybin sitting in their refrigerator. I mean, Magellan may have had excitement rounding the horn, but you in your living room later tonight can put him in the shade if you have the courage to do the things that are necessary to do. And we know what they are. And of course, the first thing to do is to tell society to fuck off because they don't know what's going on. just love that. I don't know, this, this uh, talk with Terence McKenna, I, um, I, I, I was doing the uh, Afternoon with Terence show um, every, uh, every weekday and uh, one day I heard the full version of that talk and, uh, and that little section came up and I think more than anything that inspired me. That inspired me to take the leap. And uh, I'd, I'd listen to, to what you just heard. I'd listen to that over and over again. I know it sounds silly, but um, uh, I mean, I think the first time I heard it, I uh, heard that particular version, I, I, had, I had tears in my eyes. Because that, that to me was the answer. That to me was the answer. That I, I needed to to get up the courage to to hurl myself off the precipice and and see what's out there and for me it took me a long time to do that because I I, I kept putting it off and uh, kept finding reasons why not to and the universe kept nudging me and telling me oh go on you gotta leave you gotta leave you gotta walk you gotta get out there and I'd kept saying, well, yeah, I'll give it another month and uh, maybe I'll figure out a way. <laughs> but then the universe gave me a kick up the bum. And that's when I somehow found the courage to take that leap. And, uh, and so far, so far, it's been a feather bed. Thanks for listening.